Welcome to the podcast. We do recover with Jared Miller, your host. And I'm Dr. Terry Sellers, your co-host. This is a podcast about recovery from addiction. We want to talk about what successful recovery can look like. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. It is Friday, everybody. Happy Friday. It's Listen, it's not just any Friday either, right? Like, it is the Friday of Memorial Weekend. So I hope that you have some super fun plans to get out, have a good time, maybe spend some time in the sun, do some barbecuing, have a clean and sober Memorial Weekend this weekend. Uh, episode 82 is underway here. I have invited a guy on that I know in the industry, used to work with him. He works for another great organization now. Uh, he's a fantastic intake and, and marketing guy. His name's Mitch Payne. Mitch, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Thanks for being willing to come on here. So we're going to get to Mitch's journey. Uh, before that, though, of course, episode 82, part one is brought to us by Steps Recovery Centers. Steps Recovery Centers is ready to help you or a loved one get help as soon as you're ready to reach out. You can reach out to them by calling them at 801 801- 800-8142, or you can go to their website at stepsrc.com. You can live chat with Mike or one of our intake, our intake people. Uh, I'm pre- listen, I say this every single week, it, even if it's not a good fit, right? Like we have tons of connections with people to get you into the right place for you. Can you attest to that, Mitch? Yeah. Reaching out is the hardest part. So, right. It's yeah, man. Yeah. Call there's that, no shame in it. So calling that, call that number, call that number. All right, well, check it out. We got Mitch Payne in the house. We're going to get his journey. So typically, Mitch, there's what we try to do on this podcast is really there's two parts to people's story, which is perfect because we split it into two pieces. In piece one, we're going to talk about the problem, right? Hopefully, though, the thing that when I self-critique myself, we really need to spend more time in the solution. So let's try to get to the problem uh, with the 25 minutes we have and then the solution with the other 25 minutes. Sound good, man? Yep. All right, so, Mitch, tell me a little bit about background, where you grew up, family, a little bit about Mitch Payne. All right, so I am from the southern Utah area, born and raised. Um, I grew up in a fantastic family. If I could choose again, I would choose the same family. Um, You know, I didn't have any big family issues growing up. My, you know, just grew up in a middle-class environment um, in a place in a town called Ivins. And um, I, Ivins is in beautiful Southern Utah. It's yeah. down here by St. George, yeah, right? Yeah, I love it. So for people milk that are and listen- honey. Yes, people <laughs> that are listening out of state, man, Ivins, Utah is a gorgeous place. Yeah, I bet that beautiful. was a pretty magical childhood. Yeah, it was great. Um, yeah, two loving parents. And uh, I just have one little sister, one sibling, and it was great. So, you know, leading into what we'll be talking about, you know, it doesn't really seem like I would fall into what I fell into. Yeah, I think that's fantastic, right? Because a lot of times people think that um, all addicts are people that come from dysfunctional families, and that's not my story. Yeah, That's not your story. Mm-mm. And And so I appreciate you sharing that. Let's jump into it. So, all right, we talked about the problem. At what age did you start to maybe get curious or uh, like, like where does your story of active addiction really begin? So m- my story of act- active addiction started at about 17, but as I kind of grow into this more and look back, things really started at about 14 or 15. And I think that had a lot to do with, you know, the, the company that I kept and you know we all just kind of fueled each other into you know, just poor habits and poor decisions and you know it's sort of like boys will be boys turned into boys will be criminals turned into you know <laughs> boys will do drugs and it I, just kind of snowballed from there yeah i'm not like laughing at you i'm oh I'm, yeah oh yeah right like but yeah. i totally get it because mm-hmm. when you're younger it is that right it's like boys will be boys and then as you get older i don't know if it's like one person does something crazy and and it's like challenge accepted. Yeah. Here we go. Right. Right. Like I got to one up this dude. Yeah. And you can't, and you can't not do things, you know, cause it's like, you don't want to be that guy in the group. Right. Right. For sure. So when did it, what did talk to me about 14? I mean, are we just like smoking reburn cigarettes? Are we drinking mouthwash? Like what's going on at 14? So, um, 
well, we we started stealing from you know neighbors and businesses, and um, we we ha- we we thought that we were you know Ocean's Eleven of you know <laughs> sorts, and so we were you know when I was a minor before I tried a cigarette, you know I was getting charged with breaking and entering and on probation and you know so the the ism started before i ever tried anything and so it was yeah it was just that criminal thinking that you know i'm above everything i'm not going to get caught i'm smarter than everyone um sorry about that no you're okay (laughs) um you know mixed with the fuel of you know the friends that um that i you know kept around me and by no means was it like oh it was it was them it was their fault you know it was you know it was me and it was you know like just all that into one sure you chose to be a part of that absolutely yeah, absolutely. absolutely and you know i would throw ideas in there and it was just i don't know seemed opportunity seemed, and seemed yeah. like something fun to do at the time right with the whole mature brain of a 14 year old yeah right yeah. exactly so it's interesting though because when we treat substance abuse, it's biopsychosocial, right? Mm-hmm. And so for you, it sounds like a big piece was that social. Yeah, oh yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, you had some friends that maybe you guys were a little adrenaline junkies and got wrapped up in the wrong stuff versus like me where I had a you know surgery and was prescribed opiates and, and became dependent. So all avenues, it doesn't matter what the avenue was, but it sounds like social was yours. Yeah. All right, so let's fast forward to like 17. So when I was 17, um, I went on a camping trip with some friends. And mind you, uh, even while I was getting into all sorts of trouble with the law with regard to, you know, stealing and, you know, like. Juvenile behavior. Juvenile, yeah. Yeah, just just looking back, just like dumb stuff, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was adamantly against drugs and alcohol. And I think that was just because of like, you know, I grew up LDS and I just saw what drugs and alcohol did to people. And so, you know, even before I got into it, I was like, nope, I was like Mr. Morality when it came to that for some reason. So that didn't really make a lot of sense. Um, So anyways, when I was 17, I went on a camping trip with some friends and we went up to Pine Valley and uh, one of the nights, a buddy of mine brought out some ecstasy and I was like what at 17 years old dude had ecstasy yeah wow and he I mean I was like look whatever you guys are gonna do that's that's on you wanting to fit into that social piece yeah and so I, I I didn't do it and I was like I was upset and I was mad that my friend would bring that around me because you know I was I I was pretty vocal like you know, no drugs, no alcohol, you know, let's just steal from the old woman, I guess, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, but I didn't want to do drugs and alcohol. Right. Um, no, I, and listen, I can totally relate. Right. Because I can remember like, you know, when I was in high school around 17, I was super into like sports and, and I was kind of a geek. Like I liked getting good grades, you know what I mean? And, and so I can remember like when my friends would, you know, on a weekend, they'd get a little bag it was never ecstasy but you know they get like a little bag of marijuana and they'd be smoking it and be like you guys are idiots you know what i mean yeah like i was such a jock head that i was like dude we were undefeated for two years we could win state championship guys you're throwing away your future you know yeah like, well that's but, what i thought too you know like you're you're throwing away your life and sure you know you're gonna be under a bridge with a brown bag with a bottle in your hand but you wouldn't first shot, you know. You wouldn't be on this podcast if it eventually didn't eventually those morals that. and values didn't get worn down. Right, right. Well, and uh, and I appreciate like your courage to come on here because I know like in in Utah the culture the LDS culture, I know that it takes some some guts and some bravery to come on here and like talk to people about the mistakes you've made in the dirt, right? Oh, like, yeah. so I commend you for that. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, like I said growing up in a good family and going the route that I took, that's not what I normally hear, you know, cause I work in the industry. And so, you know, I want a lot of people, you know, there's a stigma. Oh, and absolutely. so I'm happy to tell everybody everything that I went through. If it helps someone, you know, 
pick up the phone and hit a meeting or just talk to someone, you know? Absolutely. Try to find some help. Yeah. That's what this whole podcast is about, dude. Yeah. For sure. So that first night, uh, a few of my buddies, they uh, ended up doing the ecstasy. What were you thinking? Like, did they, because like, I know for me, when I get around a group of people that are like drinking, like I get annoyed because they're just idiots, right? Like in, in my mind, yeah. what was going on when you were watching that? I don't know. I guess it's kind of hard to, I don't remember like exactly what I was thinking. I remember being kind of, well, I know that I felt left out and because it looked super harmless, right? They were all, I mean, I don't know if you've ever done ecstasy. I haven't. But uh, they were, you know, all just feely and just like lovey dovey and you know it was just funny just more gazed than out yeah right? exactly just thousand yard stare yeah it wasn't like you know the end of requiem for a dream or anything like right. that where they're all freaking out in your 17 year old mind though you thought that like a zombie apocalypse was gonna start or something right? well i you know i thought i thought that things were gonna turn south and we were gonna end up in jail and you know but okay. it wasn't that you know we were just in a cabin yeah um so the next night um the drugs came out again and there was ecstasy and weed. And, um, I just remember thinking like it looked pretty harmless. Sure. So nobody died. Right. Exactly. Nobody went to the hospital. Everyone was Nobody's fine in the next jail. Day. Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, not that I'm like, you know, co-signing that it's okay to do those things, but I can understand your rationale. Right, exactly. Time. Yeah. And so, and so that was that I did it the next night. I, my very first chemical ex- chemical experience before a beer, before a cigarette, before anything was I snorted a line of ecstasy. And it was great. It was fantastic. And I felt lied to because, mm. you know, it didn't, I didn't end up in jail. I didn't get in trouble. You know, I, I just had a good time. Yeah. That I think night. that, I think a lot of teenagers, right? Like they think, I, that's a common theme that I hear a lot of. Like I felt lied to, or I felt like people, you know, made a a mountain out of a molehill. And I think what they're expecting is like, I do a mind altering substance and immediately I like get thrown in jail or right. some life altering event comes yeah. along. Right? Yeah. Right. And listen, you do it long enough and absolutely you're going to, you're going <laughs> to arrive there. Yeah. Right. But sure. Yeah. Like, I mean, we live in a world where you can pull out your phone and order pizza, you know, instantly. Everything We think everything's instant. Yeah. Okay, cool. So talk to me about what happened after that. Yeah, so I I remember, you know, doing that, and it was just kind of like the door had opened. And, you know, I was like, dare was wrong, you know. And, I, you know, <laughs> so I just felt like, yeah. you know, this this was something that maybe I wanted to experience more of. Um. Definitely increase your curiosity. Increase my curiosity, yeah, because it you know, until you've done a certain substance, you can imagine what it's going to feel like, but you don't know, right? right? And yeah, you're just assuming, really, right? Yeah, and you know, obviously, I'd never felt anything like that, and so. At what point does it start to become a chronic thing? Because safe to say, at that point, it was more recreational use, right? Yeah, yeah. How and long did the recreational use go for? Um. I don't know. Ecstasy was a very small part of my whole story because shortly after that, um, I found alcohol and it was with these same friends and, um, alcohol was brought out, you know, we had driven out to, you know, in the middle of nowhere in the Southern desert. Utah. Yeah. The yeah, desert. So exactly. The yeah. Desert everybody to party. Was, yep. Sky vodka and Red Bull was my very first drink. And, uh, I explain this when I tell other people my story, uh, when I had my first drink, I mean, it was as if, you know, like when the power goes out at your house and your refrigerator turns off and the air conditioner turns off and you don't realize how quiet everything is until everything's turned off. Yeah. That's how my mind felt. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't realize how much chatter was going on in my mind until I took that first drink. And looking back, I mean, I was an alcoholic from the very beginning. And I remember thinking, this is how I want to feel every single day of my life. And it was from that point on that I just chased that. I introduced to you the mind of somebody that is pre predispositioned to uh, a, an addiction. Oh yeah. Right. Like yeah. it's crazy because different substances, different timing, but I can remember the first time I took an opiate and I just remember like, I thought I was the funniest guy in the room. Like again, you said it perfect. If I could feel like this all the time, mm-hmm. life would be perfect. Right. Exactly. You know, like 
any anxiety is gone. I and, feel and, great. And listen, it's a lie, right? Oh, yeah. Like it, like it's, it's all synthetic. It's a, it's a temporary loan that yeah. eventually the interest is just out of this world. Yeah. But in that moment, you can't you, listen. You, we've got to be real and honest about it. In that moment, you do have those thoughts. Yeah. That is something you experience. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, most, if not all of us who have suffered from addiction have felt that way or else we wouldn't throw away literally everything to chase it. Well said, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, so I'm not sure about what age that was, maybe like 19. Well, the the time period was probably from like 17 to 19 where I was drinking, doing ecstasy. I hate marijuana, but, um, so you and me both. Yeah. That was kind of like the, I dude, I get paranoid. Oh, it's like so I, paranoid. Ate, I ate like, I'd never even really smoked marijuana, but I ate it one time in a brownie. Yeah. Right. And I'm not trying to be like, Oh, I'm this good little boy that wouldn't do it. Right. Like, but, uh, I just, after that one experience, I was like, it's not for me. Oh yeah. I thought I heard babies crying. I thought the police were coming down. Everyone the was a road. cop. Yeah. The, yeah, the like, dog is a cop. Looking out the window. Yeah, like exactly. what? Yeah. It wasn't my, wasn't my DOC either, have people, man. Oh, you didn't have the right strain. It's like, mm. That's too sciencey for me, bro. I can't, <laughs> you know, I'm just a simple minded yeah, guy. Me. But I mean, I always just chase like complete obliteration though, you know? Sure. So I ended up moving. Is it recreationally though through your teenage years? Like, is it weekends, holidays, or is it, it like? Yeah. And I think that's a lot. Like I couldn't always get it. Right. You right. know, you didn't have access. You weren't 21. Right. I wasn't 21. I don't really know at the time any ex. I still don't know any ecstasy dealers. You know, like I don't know where I would find it today. But um, those were kind of like the two main things um, that. Which I is would, interesting because one's a upper and one's a downer. Yeah. Right. Like, ecstasy's gonna make you want to dance and yeah, feel people. I don't know. I don't know. Right. Dude, I've never done it. Right. Yeah. Like, just get. All the only thing I imagine is get sweaty and rub on stuff. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I don't Alcohol's know. I would just like, like lay in a bean bag and just be like. I don't know. Got you. Okay. Um, but so, yeah, you know, while I was living at home, it was kind of on the down low. Yeah. Recreational. Mm -hmm. And so when I moved out, that's kind of when all bets were off. And so what was, age was this? This was about 20, 21. Okay. And so I'm living in Orem. I'm going to UVU at the time. And uh, the, you know, I lived in BYU housing, but all my roommates drank. And so we, but nobody drank like I drank. And I remember like kind of resenting, I, I would resent other people for just being able to stop, you know, or they didn't have to drink before going to a party. That's interesting. So you were like jealous. Yeah. That people, that, that people were actually able to handle it a little bit better than you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sign of an alcoholic for oh, sure. Oh, right? absolutely. And you know, like I, I knew that I was demonstrating alcoholism you know i wasn't oblivious to it but I, I also thought that i had it under control or like that i could stop if i wanted to kind of so in like the stages of change you're still in pre-contemplation like i don't have a problem yeah i'm and, good I, I can stop whenever i want yeah and i just thought that like i'm just better as a person if i just continue to drink you know um i thought that i was better in at work i i worked at a credit union uh, as a teller. And then I was a loan officer. Again, the lies that our addictions, our disease tells us, right? Like yeah. I'm more handsome. Yeah. I'm a smooth talker. Mm -hmm. but, but listen, some of that, I think feel, I feel like with social can be kind of true because it's a, it's a social lubricant. Like it loosens you up a little bit, gets you out of your head. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and gosh, I, I thought that, you know, after you're high for so long and I mean, high, like lifted up via a substance right so mm -hmm. you know in my case it it was strictly alcohol at this point and um i was drinking a fifth and a half a day it got, you know that's a lot dude a ton yeah, yeah. and so if i it sounds I, like you were still functional too yeah for, i mean for the most part but i had to drink in the mornings to you know sober up basically to not get the dts yeah i mean yeah. i would you know shake um i had a couple of seizures and um i mean things went downhill pretty quick. But were there I'm, people in your life around that time that were like kind of raising the caution flag for you? Does that make sense? Like, you know, like, did they ever try to be like, Mitch, man, you should probably slow down or, Hey Mitch, dude, maybe, 
maybe don't drink today. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, there were some girls that I dated and, like, you know, I ruined the relationship or, you know, I had a, a roommate who would, you know, say little comments like that. Like, you're looking a little yellow, you know, and but right. it was like, well, I, you know, I can't stop now. Like, did was, you actually think that in your head? Yeah, there was actually one point where I. So I, your outward, your outward appearances, I got this under control, mm -hmm. but your internal dialogue is. I oh, can't stop. I, it's a black hole, you know, like it's interesting this is gonna crash at some yeah. point i remember one time i picked up the phone to call my dad and uh i was like man like but there was like that and in no world would my dad be like what the hell you know right. like he would be right. by my side immediately like let's get this fixed um but you know i didn't want to disappoint him i'm off on my own and it's like well you failed you know like you came up here to go to school and all you did was drink and you know and so pride is a powerful thing man yeah you know, that that what i think you think about me right it can make people do some crazy stuff yeah and it keeps us from reaching out and getting help because yeah. we don't want to we we view that as a weakness yeah when really it's a strength right but when well, we it's like it and if you too. told someone for so long that you're doing so well it's like there goes your glass house yeah you know shattered yeah dude i love that reference yeah, yeah it's great um so you be you going to college yeah you realize man i i you're telling people like oh i'm god i got this i'm cool i'm uh, everything's under control but really the internal p is like dude yeah panic mode right yeah well and so then i got a dui and that's kind of like when we when reality hits right yeah and it yeah. and it did and so got arrested went to utah county jail and the first thing I did when I got out was drink because that's the only thing I knew what to, you know that's the only way I knew how to handle the situation um, was to like just push it down with alcohol you know sure and uh, and I don't care what anybody says getting arrested is is a, is a traumatic event oh yeah it was like especially if you've never been to jail before you get put in these gross clothes that stink <laughs> yeah. right they take everything you have from you yeah. You walk into a, a room full of dudes that look at you like your lunch meat. Yeah. Like, it is. I don't care what you say. You can be, maybe I'm just not as tough as some people, but it's, a, it's well, it, me it either. Is. And I've been arrested, you know, a bunch of different times and it never got easier for me. Like I hated it every time. Yeah. So when you get out <laughs> that addict, you know, the midbrain tells you, we know how to deal with all that. Yeah. Just make it go away. Yeah. Um, so eventually you know, things got so bad that yeah, I ended up getting another DUI shortly after that in the same year. This was in 2014. And yeah, I'm driving down from Orem to St. George to go on a family vacation. You know, my parents had bought me tickets to go to on a cruise uh, with them. And as I'm driving down I-15, my thought was I'm not going to be able to drink what I'm used to drinking like the amount that I'm used to drinking on this ship with my family. Sure. You'll so, get caught. Yeah. My best idea was to drink as much as possible on the way down to like try and ward off DT, you know, like this was like my best for thinking. sure, bro. Listen, I know that we're right now we're in the problem, but I'm going to jump into the solution for a minute. Yeah. That's when, when I say like we have invisible handcuffs, like that's what I mean. Right? Like I couldn't go anywhere unless I had enough whatever opiates to get me through and it yeah. sounds like the same thing with you you can't even go and enjoy a freaking cruise with your family oh yeah i like, was that's dreading just it. slavery man yeah yeah i was dreading it um and that i mean shortly after that is when all you know i went to rehab a bunch of different times and you say a bunch of different were you like robert downey jr i mean how many is a bunch of different like i went to residential treatment 12 times 12 times yeah and then you know that's not including like other detoxes and er visits and iop attempts and you know do you think that maybe and we only have about a minute it looks like if our clock's right but um do you think that maybe you were doing it for the wrong reasons at first treatment yeah um i don't know like maybe you know i i knew that like my i didn't have anywhere to go i didn't really have anything going for me and it's what my family wanted me to do and so that's what i was gonna so do so you didn't have like a burning desire but at the same time it was convenient no i really didn't have that like burning desire until the last time i went through got you yeah. 12 times man yeah like crazy a, a ton just because i don't where did you go to treatment at 
I Are went they 12 different places. No. So I've been, I mean, gosh, I've been to a lot of places. Well, we'll have to get back to that in part two okay. of episode 82 here. Uh, so far, Mitch Payne's come on and, and t- we've just been talking about the problem. We're going to move into the solution in, in episode 82, part two. You are listening to We Do Recover with Jared Miller and co-hosted by Dr. Terry Sellers. We'll be right back after this short break with more of We Do Recover with Jared Miller, sponsored by Steps Recovery Center and the Hilton Garden Inn. I'm Desmond Lomax, one of the clinical executives here at Steps Recovery. And once you become of the Steps family, you're just a part of the Steps family. A lot of us have overcome substances, overcome addiction, and now we're able to help other people. Second of all, we're also going to help you in a way where you can afford to be helped. Third of all, we're going to give you the same quality that many organizations are charging two to three times. And it's more about you than it is about our organization. We welcome you back to We Do Recover with Jared Miller, co-hosted by Dr. Terry Sellers. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. And now with part two of our podcast, Jared Miller and Dr. Terry Sellers. Hey, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us through that uh, little break that we had there. Uh, Steps Recovery Centers, thank you for sponsoring this podcast. All right. So episode 82, part two is is underway here. Um Mitch is going to d- dive more into the solution part of his story and his journey into recovery. But before that, though, we want to show our sponsors some love. If you or a loved one's traveling through southern Utah, give them a Google search. Type in Hilton Garden Inn. They have amazing amenities. It's always it's always bright at the it's always sunny and bright at the Hilton Garden Inn in St. George, Utah. Um, yeah, love those guys. Our other sponsorship is. Recovery Strong. Recovery Strong is all about fighting addiction and strengthening recovery. Um, Listen, there is a stigma, like Mitch has said. If you want to wear your recovery out loud and and basically be part of the solution of moving out of that stigma, go to recoverystrong.com. Recoverystrong.com. Click on the apparel tab. Get yourself a hat, t-shirt. They got some cool hoodies. Today, I'm actually rocking uh, one of their mugs. I got this nice Recovery Strong mug. I love it. Keeps things cold. Keeps it hot. Got Recovery Strong on the one side and their slogan on the other. Yeah, but how does it know? I don't know, man. <laughs> how does it know to keep it hot? How does it know to keep it cold, that's man? A, that's a great question. That's a great question. I don't know. You doing okay over there, Sean? I'm doing good, yeah. We completely missed New and Goods, and it's because we were kind of friends. New and good. Okay, so yeah, talk, that works. talk to me, big cat. What, how's, how's, how's your week been? I spent a week in Arkansas. What? Yeah. Went on a date with my sister and everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's kidding, no. everybody. I know. It was my cousin. No, my uh, <laughs> wife had a uh, a conference there, and she's like, hey, you want to go to Arkansas for the week? I said, absolutely not. And so we spent a week in Arkansas. Nice, man. Compromise. Yeah, compromise. I did what she said. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. She's not the same without you. No I offense know, to Max. Missed you. And I'm having a hard time getting back. You've, there's been some snafus today. Yeah, it's it's okay. It's all good. It's it. Yeah, it might have me frazzled a little bit, but I'm sure, you know, Mitch well, over here's got ice veins. I did ice fall, off, veins, the, I so did fall off the wagon, though. Uh-oh. I had a couple Mountain Dew today. I've been Mountain Dew free for months. Oh, I you, needed a Mountain Dew. You lapsed on Mountain Dew. I Listen, lapsed on Mountain Dew. Sean, the most important thing is what you do moving forward from here on. Okay. You know, we all make mistakes, man. Just reach out. Just, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do better. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see Sean in, you know, one of those meetings. <laughs> My name's Sean, and I'm addicted to Mountain Dew. One time I had three Advil. I, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, you're one of those normie folk. Yeah, I, yeah, I am. So, <laughs> I, What would happen if I showed up in one of those meetings? Would, would there just be like a whole bunch of eye rolling? Would it be like, no. what's this guy doing here? You just say you were there for support. I mean, I don't know who you'd be supporting, but. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're always welcome to oh, come. Okay. Fellowship just meetings. <laughs> All right, let's get back on track. So, Mitch, you were talking about 12 different. I mean, you're competing with Robert Downey Jr. for the most rehab stints right <laughs> um you're talking about uh what right before we got cut off See, i got a question you said you went to rehab what 12 times yeah how much is that i don't even want to know how much is that well insurance covers most of it oh okay but still how much is that okay so if insurance covers it what, what's the cost because i'm again you say going to rehab and it, i've heard big numbers 
once or twice, but 12 times, that seems to be a big number for a, I'm sure, I'm sure some of it comes out of somebody's pocket. It dep- I guess it depends on like the insurance plan that you have, but I know like, it, because a lot of my time was down in Arizona and I, if I remember correctly, and I don't remember a lot in Arizona, <laughs> I was on Arizona Medicaid. Okay. You know, and so, so I guess the you. Arizona taxpayer. Now, is, is that, is that something that's available to uh, people who don't have insurance you know, going to rehab and whatnot? Yeah, there's, you can either be, there's options yeah, there's everywhere options. for everything for everybody. Because I'm hearing about some of these programs, you know, $10,000 a day or whatever they are and super expensive. You know, talk about the Robert Downey Juniors that have money to actually pay for these things. But when it comes to somebody who doesn't have insurance or a job or family with a lot of commas in their bank account. So they can either do like Medicaid. There's not a ton of inpatient places for Medicaid. Um, They can also jump on the uh, marketplace marketplace and get a plan. Yeah, most of the time. Or, you know, some people do cash pay. Family helps out. That's actually part of what we're going to get to later on in the episode with what Mitch is doing today. I was reading your notes ahead of time. I'm sorry. You're good, man. You're good. (laughs) So uh, we left off right when you were basically talking about gone to 12 different places. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that last time. Like, let's, let's go from there. Like, what was different between the last time and the 11 other times before that? Okay, so uh, the last time that I went through, um, I came straight from Purgatory, which is the jail um, around here. Um, I had just moved back from Arizona. And by this point, I'm, you know, like a couple years deep into IV meth and heroin use. So things progressed pretty drastically. Um, I was homeless, living in a car. And uh, so I moved, my dad moved me back from Arizona and I got arrested on day one from him moving me back. He spent all this money to get me in sober living. And so I'm arrested, I'm in purgatory. You'd moved into sober living. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, and day one. And day one. Yeah. Man, that's, hey, that was perfect. It happened exactly (laughs) how it was supposed to happen, Mitch. So um, I guess this part's kind of big for me because whenever and this is, you know, one of my proudest sentences ever. Whenever I was in purgatory, whenever I was arrested, um, I had always called my parents. You know, I usually called out to mom because, you know, pull on the heartstrings a little bit, sure. I guess. You know, yeah. anyone who... Would, we know how to manipulate our families. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I called my mom and she didn't answer. And I was like, the audacity of her not to answer my <laughs> jail call, you know. And it, I, it was her birthday or the day before her birthday. And she and my dad had gone, um, I believe it's was in San Diego for her birthday. And I knew that they weren't going to pick up the call. And I don't know, for some reason, like I was, you know, sitting in the block and I was like, man, like, have I really messed up that bad? And I knew I did. And, it, but it was just like, I'm sober. I can't escape these feelings now. And it's all hitting me at once. And like a baseball bat. Yeah. And I'm homeless. I'm unemployed. I'm not employable. And charges racking up and it's just gone like, from that 14 year old boy that was against all that stuff to right to oh hey IV this user. isn't so bad to you know now i'm everything that i always swore against and listen we we kind of laughed and chuckled at the first of the you know but i want to point out it's because what are we going to do we're either going to laugh about it or cry about it right and right. so so we kind of laugh about it but that's not condoning those things and as you can tell uh right now in in this part of mitch's story this is what it this is the end result yeah. This is where it leads to yeah. if you let it just spiral. Right. And, you know, you hike 50 miles in and you have to hike 50 miles out and everyone's scared of that hike out. Um, I know I was. So I was released straight from purgatory into treatment. And um, my coworker now, his name is Ty MB. Uh, he does admissions with me at Hope Rising. He actually got me into steps at the time. This was in 2017, and I had been through steps before. Um, I didn't really know what was going to be different, um, but I know what I did different was whatever they told me to do, that's what I was going to do, right? For sure. And, and love Ty Ampy. Great uh, dude. Oh, he's fantastic. Dude. Love him. Yeah. And, you know, so if they told me that I had to scrub toilets to stay sober, that's what I was going to do. Right? So, so you went from being maybe – willful to willing yeah right? you like know you like transition. i would follow the rules i was never like a rule breaker i wasn't never like obstinate towards what treatment said but you know i always had like that reservation in the back of my mind like i know what i'm doing but you know? but i mean listen there are there are different types of people that go through treatment like oh, and yeah. you can identify them like 
uh, safe to say maybe prior to this time, you were just kind of a butt in the seat. Right. Yeah. Like you're there. You yeah. know what I mean? You, I mean, I would do my assignments and I would, sure. you know, Go I, I wouldn't cause problems. Well, for the most part, I, I mean, I probably have some therapists who thought differently. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wasn't like a bad client or anything. This time you're super willing though. Yeah. I've kind of like got through life like that, you know, like I'm not causing problems, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. But maybe I wasn't like just flying under the radar. Yeah. 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 So I had a, so like I said, I was super willing to do whatever they told me to do um, because my decisions weren't working and my decisions got me, you know, with a needle in my arm, suicide attempts. I mean, just so anything that I was doing wasn't working. So I had a therapist. Her name was Caprice Compton. Shout out. Um, she, I mean, she changed my life. She was amazing and she's tough. She's really tough. And she had given me this assignment to identify what my values are. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever asked someone who's, you know, two weeks into recovery, what their values are, but they probably don't know because I know that I didn't know. And so I wrote them down and I was the like, the point is asking the question. Though. Right. So they have to think about right. it. Right. And yeah. so that question was asked and I was like, well, well, you know, my values are honesty and integrity. And, but that was a lie, you know, cause I wasn't living that way. I was, I was manipulative and I would, you know, I was lying to everyone. And did it take you back to the time when those were your values though? Because a big part of, you know, as a substance abuse counselor, a big part of how I treat people is trying to get them connected back to the person they were before drugs and alcohol overtook their life. Well, and, and you know, maybe that was because it seemed like if I looked back from the time that I started using until, you know, that moment, I had lost who I was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, drugs and alcohol took my identity from me. And I was just whoever I needed to be to continue to use drugs and alcohol. So if you look at the whole picture, that's a perfect assignment because it made, it asked questions that made you think. Yeah. And so what I, I, I had to like really find what my values were again. And the only way that I could figure out how to do it, cause I, I sat on that assignment for weeks and, um, I had to figure out what my values were by thinking about the opposite of, okay. So like, let me give you an example. I found that the the feeling that I hate worst in my life is feeling worthless. And when I'm using and drinking and lying to my family and stealing, I feel worthless. Yeah. Spiritually bankrupt. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's how I live my life for, you know, nine years. And so I had to figure out how to feel like I had worth. And so my, my number one value in life today is purpose, um, which doesn't mean a lot if you don't put an action behind it. And for me, the action to feel as though I have worth and I have a purpose is uh, being of service to other people. Beautiful. And that was kind of like my full circle moment. I'm getting kind of emotional. Um, it's all right, man. Yeah, that was kind of like my full, um, my full circle moment that the only way that I was going to have purpose and not feel like I had to, you know, kill myself or use drugs to numb all my feelings was to be of service to other people and to get, get outside of the selfishness, the self-centeredness. Yeah. yeah. Self-serving. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think it's beautiful, Mitch, how you kind of reverse engineered it. Yeah. You know? Cause a lot of people, I realize you sat on the assignment for a few weeks, but people don't know how to like problem solve typically when they, when they still have, you know, they're coming off of substances. Yeah. And so the fact that you were able to go, okay, I hate this feeling. The opposite of this feeling is this. That's what I want to work towards. Right. It's like, how do I get there? Yeah. That's, I mean, my hat's off to you. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, early recovery, I was still just doing whatever people told me to do. And, you know, I went through the whole program, day treatment, IOP. Um, I got really involved in Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm still involved in Alcoholics Anonymous today. I still regularly go to meetings and, um, I have a sponsor. We work the steps, we meet regularly, and uh, I still try to be of service everywhere that I can. And eventually I you know, started working in the industry, um, doing admissions and helping kind of facilitate people getting I into think, treatment. I think that point is a good point though, and I know I've talked about this before, but it's okay, I, well, let's revisit it. You know, treatment really is the bridge between active addiction and long-term recovery. Yeah. And if you don't find something, once you come over that bridge, 
to continue the path into long-term recovery, like a fellowship, doesn't matter what fellowship it is, right? I, I love like the USARA theme, all pathways that lead to recovery, you know, support all pathways that lead to recovery. But it's important to find something that's going to continue on that path. Yeah. And so sounds like AA American Airlines. I mean, Alcoholics <laughs> Anonymous. Yeah. Was that for you? So it's, I guess I'm just seeing that now because you know how you said biopsychosocial, it was a huge social piece for me that eventually kind of transitioned me into long term recovery because I'm still very good friends with the group that I went through residential day treatment and IOP. And two of them were in my wedding line. Shout out to Rudy. Shout out to Brooks. And so cool. Man. Yeah. And, you know, so I'm still friends with them today. And it was just, it was a big social piece. You know, when I, when I first got out of treatment and I guess while I was going through treatment, you know, but like I stuck to the guys, I hung out with the guys and clung to the rooms. And cause I'll, I'll tell clients still today, treatment ends and treatment is relatively short compared to sure. your life. It right. May, it may not feel like it in the right. moment. Oh right? yeah. Everyone but, always wants to get to the next step. Absolutely. Um, but it's really just a, a drop in the bucket and it's just do as much as you can to create the foundation so that you can continue to do this and foster those relationships so that oh, yeah. you can continue to stay around the people that have the same kind of mindset goals and aspirations that you have. Yeah. Um, Oh man, there was something there that I was going to say. I, I always tell people all the time, you can go, you could go to treatment 500 different times, but when you leave treatment, if you just go right back to the same environment and the same friends that you had before, yeah, you're going to have a 501 time experience because I hate platitudes, dude. I really do. Yeah. But this one's fitting. If nothing changes, nothing changes. Oh yeah. Well, those sound dumb and they don't make sense until they do. Right. <laughs> yep. It's a perfect it's way like of saying easy it. Easy does it. It's like you hate hearing stuff like that until you hear it. You know? Right. Right. So now today, sitting here Friday Memorial Weekend. How many years do you have clean? I'm terrible at math. Um, I'm. I guess I'm coming up on five. Five. Five years. What were some of the things that were tough for you to get to five years? Because I've actually heard people say getting clean was hard, but staying clean is just as hard. Um. I'm, I'm kind of a creature of habit, I guess, you know, I, I try to do the same things. I get up, I go to work. I mean, looking at my life now, as compared to the chaos that it was before, like I have kind of a boring life, you know, like I get up or go to peaceful, work. right? Depends yeah. on how you look at right, it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I come home and go to the gym and, but I mean, like in early recovery, like if you can, if you can think back, like I can think back and I know for me where, you know, opiates was my thing and heroin and tinfoil was a thing like anytime I was at a family event and people would take tinfoil off of the food that they brought mm -hmm. boom big trigger right like I'm like oh man sick to the stomach yeah. those big lighters huge trigger for me can you remember some of those things that that were maybe difficult for you to be around in early recovery um gosh I or, can't really because there's like, internals and ex there's yeah. internal and external triggers, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe some feelings or thoughts that, that were triggering for you. Gosh, me. I mean, maybe some like TV shows, you know, okay. like even like some theme songs, like that would kind of like bring back some stuff, but I so don't know. So mostly the I'm, media that you consumed, right? Yeah. Songs, TV shows. Yeah. People were talking about that show. Uh, oh man, it was about the Oxycontin. What was the name of that? Oh, um, with Michael Keaton. You know, the series on Hulu. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I could not watch that. I I got like one episode in and I'm like, uh-uh, nope. No, I didn't I it. didn't watch that either. Gosh, I wish I could remember what that was called. But yeah, I don't know. I guess it was like the media, but I mean, I was in AA and, you know, and I still am, but I mean, I was trying to hit 14 meetings a week. I, right. I lived in the rooms and I, because I your mean, obsession had switched from alcohol to Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. yeah. And you know, so in that sense, you know, the rooms save me and I have a service position in AA now. And, you know, so I try to give back as much as I can that way. But I, gosh, I don't know other than, you know, just my willingness and, you know, working hard in the 12 steps and, um, doing my best to find a connection with a power greater than myself. Um, like it, it was just 
easier that time. And it, and I, and I feel like it's because I just completely gave myself yeah. to the, to recover. Truly surrendered. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it took 12 recovery centers and, you know, an <laughs> autograph, you know, book from Robert Downey Jr. to get there. You right, know? right, right. Let's get that guy on the podcast, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, Let's see if he cool. wants to compete with Mitch Payne. <laughs> Okay, so I love I love when a 12-step guy comes on my podcast because, you know, I'm a 12-step person. It worked for me. I actually, um, even though opiates was my, my drug of choice, I came up through AA as well. Yeah, and I'm a heroin addict, you know, and I go to AA. You know, alcohol is probably the majority of my story, but I still had, you know, several years of heroin and meth. And, and the thing I liked about that fellowship, I go to, I go to a different one now. Um, I go to NA now. Uh, just because our our recovery community in NA is just phenomenal down here. Oh yeah, in Southern it's great. Utah. It's huge, and most of my friends go there, right? And I want to mm-hmm. be socially accepted too, so I go because my friends go. Yeah, we're a little bit similar in that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but but I loved that it had the spiritual component to it. Yeah, because at that time, I I had this anger issue with God, right? And I found that through AA, like I could forget the God of my previous understanding and formulate a new one. Yeah. And for me, that was a huge shift. That was a huge mind change in my mind because I went from being like ashamed and, uh, feeling like an outcast to accepted and loved and being a part of something bigger than myself, which was the rooms. Yeah. 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 And, and that's a big part of, you know, what they teach you because it kind of goes from like a religious sort of view to a spiritual sort of view and nobody cares what your you know, higher power is because it's yours. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So talk to me, I want to get a little bit like you have five years, right? And, and what was the difference between step one and step 12? Like, like from the time, what did your life look like in step one versus what your life looked like after you completed step 12? Well, um, I, I couldn't say I, when I first got out of treatment is when I, restarted the steps because they usually have you do a few steps while you're in treatment and so I would do like one two three over and over and over and over again right but it wasn't until I got a sponsor who was you know super old guy and I chose him because I knew that he would have nothing better to do than work the steps with me right (laughs) and prior to then I always chose like the cool sponsor but we never worked the steps so I chose this old man and you know we would work through the steps and I would go visit him like at his old folks home and we would work the steps. That's rad. And <laughs> so I remember one time I I went to the club and I picked up my 6 month chip and I bawled because I hadn't had 6 months without a substance in my body since I was 17, you know, and years. Yeah, years and years Almost and years. Almost a decade. Yeah. And so I, I mean it was a huge deal for me and I remember I was driving home um from that and I that's when I knew that there was a power greater than myself because my, I was probably around like step six, seven, kind of working on those character defects. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I looked back on how much my life had changed in a short amount of time and something greater than myself that was helping me through this was at that point undeniable. And I had always tried to deny it and I couldn't find a reason to deny a power greater than myself. And I mean, things, Things had already changed so much for me, but I mean, dude, I love it. And I can totally relate. Like I always tell people, you know, there's some people that are 12 step haters and I'm like, listen, I get it. Right. Like you want to be special. You want to be unique. You don't want to do something that's worked for tens of thousands of people over years. Here's the deal though. From the time I started step one to the time I finished step 12, my life had completely turned around. Yeah. I was no longer the same Jared Miller. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right? But, yeah. Like the change that happened in me. Yeah. And it sounds like in you, I couldn't deny it. Right. Like there's no way. Like I would be put in a loony bin if I tried right. to. And other people couldn't either because right. I was the rehab retread, you know? And so, but it's not, it's not, you know, that's not how everyone gets sober and that's fine. And however you want to do it, I think that's great. Absolutely. You know, like find something that works for you. I know what worked for me and just find something. If anything, and dive in. Don't right. dip a toe. No, dive in. Yeah, because guess know, what? That, that, you, that's the only way you're gonna make it. Right. You can't do this one foot in, one foot out. Oh yeah. Like whether you know, twelve steps, Dharma, smart. I mean, find something. Revolutionary recovery. Give yeah. all of yourself to it, and then, if it doesn't work, 
then you can back out. Sure. You know? Yeah. Like they say that they'll then try your plan. Gladly refund your misery. <laughs> there yeah. you go. There you go. So listen, we got about a minute and a half here left. I know today, Mitch, you're a married dude. Talk to me. What does life look like today? Like oh. what are, what promises of recovery have come, come all the way full circle for you? Oh man, it's crazy. I love my life today. You know, I have a beautiful wife. Her name's Danny. Um, and you know, we have a home, a little dog, and I wake up every day, just super grateful for the life that I have today. Um, I work with, I work with Ty Empey now, which just blows my mind. Love I work that, for, a, an awesome, uh, employer the mayfield family who own hope rising and i do admissions for them and it's a growing company and i you know feel welcome there and i feel loved there and i just never thought that i would be first employable and you know working at a place where i feel valued and i feel uh loved and by everyone around me did you know ty mp is the first dude that got me a full-time job working in recovery really yeah crossover he i didn't know the, that but i believe it he knew the dude that was like in charge and he called and put in a good word like, really yeah i'll always be grateful for that dude we should have a whole parade about ty because <laughs> i mean he gives so much to the community he does i mean just softball all the races recovery i mean yeah he kills it good dude well listen man thank you so much for coming on here Oh yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty, uh, pretty cool thing that we got going on here. You know, uh, you've been a great example on this podcast. Hopefully people can listen to it, relate and spread a little hope. Yeah. All right, guys. That's, an, that's, uh, the end of episode 82. Join us next week for episode 83. Thank you for joining us today on we do recover with Jared Miller. Help us spread our message of hope, like comment and share. If you have any topics or ideas for future shows, please share that on our Facebook page. That Facebook page is We Do Recover with Jared Miller. If you or a loved one needs help, please reach out to us. Again, thank you for listening. Brought to you by Steps Recovery Center and the St. George Hilton Garden Inn. This has been a production from A Podcast Studio.